coming up on Garden Talk. If it keeps raining and you're like, damn, I got to water in my liquid nutrients. I got to get nutrition in there. That can be a conundrum because your plant's wet already. And that's why it's good to cover yourself with, well, it's been raining, but I did have some top dress. Thinning. Outside, thinning your plants out. When you're out there scouting for pests, you're not going crazy through, like, you got to thin it out a little for air movement and not creating microclimates uh, for pests. Microbes, man, game changer for the grow. You're gonna do a lot better. And don't think, it's a misconception. I used to think this as well, like, oh, well, I'm using synthetic nutrients or salt-based nutrients or this. It just, it's not gonna work well with the microbes. They can work together for sure in your grow media. Grow your plants as happy and healthy as possible, and that helps a ton with pests. A plant that's ailing or showing signs, like the, the pests know, they'll come to that. They'll, they'll have an easier chance of taking it out. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Groat, and you're tuned into the Garden Dog Podcast. This is episode number 29. In this episode, I interview Dude from The Dude Grow Show. He has been gardening for 18 years, and he grows a variety of plants, such as peppers, tomatoes, arugula, strawberries, and medicinal varieties. He also has a show, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, called The Dude Grow Show. The show has been around since 2013, and so far there have been over 1,200 episodes. In this podcast episode, we talk about outdoor gardening. Dude talks about his style of outdoor gardening and some of the challenges that can be faced when gardening outdoors. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast who help make that goal possible. A big supporter of this podcast is AC Infinity. They sponsor this podcast and I use their products. AC Infinity now has gardening tools and accessories such as heavy duty fabric grow pots, trimmers, grow room glasses, drying racks, plant ties, and trellis nets. They also have all of the equipment needed for a ventilation system. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. Big shout out to Dutch Pro for sponsoring this podcast. Dutch Pro is a plant fertilizer company that has been around for over 30 years. They have base nutrients, and they also have additives such as PK boosters, root stimulators, CalMag, silica, a nutrient optimizer, and a foiler feed. They also have pH regulators to help ensure that the nutrients can be uptaken properly. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below, and you can use coupon code MrGrow at 10DP for a discount on their products. Thanks to Spider Farmer for sponsoring this podcast. They have board style LED grow lights, bar style LED grow lights, grow tents, inline fans, and carbon filters. They also have complete grow tent kits, which include lighting, a ventilation system, grow pots, a trellis net, a timer, and a monitor for both temperature and humidity. Coupon code MrGrowIt5 will get you a discount on their products, and I'll leave a link to their Amazon store down in the description section below. Okay, now let's get into the episode. All right, we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Dude from the Dude Grow Show. How are you doing today? Excellent, man. Thank you for having me on here. Always love a little grow talk. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, makes me feel iry inside. Happy to have you. I was just on your show. Uh, great time. A lot of positive feedback in the comment section there. Uh, people really like to see these collabs happen. It seems like you get more and more co- uh, positive feedback in the comment section about collaborations going on in the community. So I appreciate you coming on and collabing here. We're going to get to know about you and uh, kind of your growth style with outdoor growing. We'll talk about some challenges with outdoor growing. Yeah, it should be an action-packed talk. So to begin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Hmm, gardening, I don't know, first came to me as, I wouldn't say challenges, but sometimes I thought I could do things better with plants. I mean, the very way back in the day would be, my dad had tropical plants in the house. And when you have tropical plants in the house, so... My, uh, my first plant was a tropical plant in my bedroom. I'm like, we got to get some ambiance in here, you know, just a little bit of uh, make this nice. And then it led from there to really, I've always liked hot stuff, hot sauce. Me and my brother would challenge each other with who could eat the hot jalapenos out of the jar. Um, then it's like, dude, I can probably just grow some habaneros. 
And uh, that turned into just messing with people, right? Drying them, making hot powders, habanero pepper eating challenges. Um, and then I guess finally just getting into, yeah, the, the value of medicinal plants um, was what really when I started to grow indoors. Um, and then recent, not recently, but later in my growing career, had the opportunity in Colorado to get some grows under my belt outdoors. Um, just on the backyard level, you know, for, you know, medicinal garden for myself. But that's it in a nutshell. Nice. I have yet to grow peppers. I actually planted a couple pepper seeds. Uh, actually, I have the seeds right here. They're uh, bullnose pepper from uh, Baker Creek. So um, I planted like four of them, and they didn't sprout. So I got to give it another shot. One thing that was really cool about peppers that I found out is like you can grow them in small containers and get like a decent personal yield out of it, like one gallon containers. So I thought that was cool. You definitely can. I'll give you a quick tip. I had some seeds have been harder for me to start for peppers and do it. Did you do like a soak? I did the paper towel soak with them for probably at least, I was thinking it was two to maybe four days, keeping it soaked, watching them to, just to start to get them to pop a little and get their first little tail, the little root coming out. And then I planted them, I had much better success. I'll have to give that a try. Yeah. Yeah. And across the it... board for a bunch of different seeds that actually can, can help out, help get them excited to, to go. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to give it another shot because peppers is definitely something I want to grow. Um, you know, not just those bullnose ones or, or bell-style peppers or habaneros. It's, it's, it's endless. Um, Carolina Reapers, right? That would be cool to grow one of those eventually. <laughs> nice. Cool. So do you typically grow indoors, outdoors, or both? Both. Um, so it would be indoors typically all the time except for when it's summertime. I have a... It's whether it's been a grow room currently, I have a five by five grow tent that I have out in my garage. So summertime, I find it convenient wherever you're gr or indoor grow. I like to enjoy it. I call it summer, summertime. And like, I'm usually so busy with the outdoor growing going on in summertime that to have to deal with both responsibilities as well as the cleanliness you should be doing when going between the two, because it's really easy to run around and just go into your tent and go out. So right now outside for me, um, I only have two very small medicinal plants because uh, they're only in one gallons right now. I basically said I'm going to quit growing my medicinal plants outside where I'm at because of the problems I've ran. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia here compared to growing outside in Colorado, a whole different animal. Um, but I do keep busy with, like we said before, I grow peppers outside every year, strawberries. Actually, I've gotten into strawberry. I've gone strawberry basket crazy because I love it. Keeps them one at head height for when you're walking around to see what's ready to pick and just, mm, mm. and then uh, two, it can help keep a lot of different pests away from them. And then lastly, a bunch of tomatoes. I don't eat tomatoes. My neighbors are like, what? You don't, what are you doing? I'm like, Hey, they're for you. They're for the wife. They're for gifting to the neighbors. Um, but yeah, that, that'd be what's going on. What's growing on as far as what I'm growing right now. Uh, but yeah, no indoors, not until fall. Things got to cool off too. Sometimes summer can just be too hot for the indoor growers to have the proper equipment um, to maintain all that. Gotcha. Now on the kind of medicinal plant side of things, are you the type of person that chases after yield or do you kind of let the plants do their thing and not really worry about yield as much? You're going to get yield typically outdoors. I mean, we're talking like these things love, love to grow. I'm not ever usually chasing yield first. It's going to know what you're starting with. What either you're starting with a quality source seeds or maybe some trusted cuts. Um, so chasing plant health first and foremost but yield outside people should remember when you're thinking about growing medicinal plants outside what what is your goal how much is this just to try to see if you have a green thumb and how which i believe everybody has some sort of green it's it's, it's genetic it's in you um but since you can get a lot of yield i mean you could grow three five gallon plants and depending on people's consumption uh be good to go until the next season around so and that being said, upscaling that, you could grow two 20-gallon plants. You're like, oh, my God, this is too much, too big. Uh, so, no, don't chase yield. Uh, but, uh, yeah, mainly know what I'm starting with is super important, what, what potential it has, and that it's good genetics. Gotcha. Let's focus on growing outdoors. Really, I want to get into your style of growing. I want to start with, with IPM and some of my viewers are going to laugh at this because usually IPM's at the very end and I'm like, hey, we probably should have started with IPM because it's just, it's so important. And for those that don't know, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, in layman's terms, it's really just things that you do in order to prevent pests, right? So um, tell me, what do you typically do in order to prevent pests? Well, I like the last word in that. It's management, right? 
So it does, you are trying to prevent, you're going to have pests outside. If you know your area, if you have the opportunity to talk to different growers, or even maybe some of the pests you'll see on other garden plants, you might get an idea of what you're going to have to deal with. Um, so for me here, I didn't talk to many growers, the area in Vancouver, especially I'm in a little microclimate where I live, tons of humidity and pests that kick my butt are always new ones to me. It's for here, it was called the corn earworm on my outdoor buds. Never dealt with that before. I had no clue. Um, most important thing I'd say for IPM on outdoors, since we are in an environment that we're not controlling as much as the indoors is being there and scouting. Um, also being able to thin out your plants, uh, they can get so big and bushy and so you can have air movement uh, depending on the size of them. But scouting and looking around, because it can be nice, you could go by, you could go outdoors for two weeks, maybe a month, and be walking around and looking at your grow and have no problems because nature's in balance, things are taking care of things. Uh, but then eventually, what, what happened to me, because I had a nice hops plant, I was growing some hops just to look cool. I'm not going to do anything with them, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to brew as well. But uh, that brought in some aphids, which in turn, they, they actually, it was, this hops plant was right next to the medicinal plant. And the aphids just preferred it for like a few weeks. They just stayed on it. I'm like, okay, if that was an indicator plant, I'll call that then. I'll leave them alone to be there. And eventually, of course, they worked their way over because um, I wanted to see what's happened. And then I, I got a ton of ladybugs. Ladybugs can be really good outside for aphids, especially since they're big enough to watch them just go on in and eat those suckers. I'll just stand out there with like hanging out, maybe with a pine or whatnot, and just watch them go to war. And that, that was refreshing. When you can see the bugs are big enough, some of our predatory insects aren't big enough to enjoy that. But when you can see them eating the bugs that are going to bug your plant, um, that's really good. I mean, we can go as deep as you want with IPM outdoors as far as what to do when we, we see pests and whatnot. But that's first off, scouting. Makes sense. Now, are you also, I mean, important piece is to check the undersides of the leaves, right? I mean, I know. Yeah, how do we do that? For sure. Underside of the leaves, you're going to want to be looking there. A lot of bugs, I won't even say that. I was going to say a lot of bugs you can see by the naked eye, but it, you do need a loop. Uh, I ran into hemp russets outside one time, um, and you do need a magnification to see those. Uh, spider mites like to start, uh, from my notice, on the lower parts of the plant, on the underside of the leaves. Uh, before you start to see a bunch of damage going up the plant, you can usually catch them. When you do run, if we want to do a preventative maintenance, let's, let's say you notice maybe a few aphids or a few spider mites. So if we're in veg, we can the preventative spray. I know you like neem. I like neem as well. I actually don't mind the smell of neem at all. It's super natural. It's inexpensive, easy to apply. Um, but doing a type of spray program once every week, isn't bad, but I don't want to spray anything that's going to hurt. Also, if things again, I said are working like in balance, like nature, the bugs are taking care of each other. I have a few. I don't want to hurt anything that's doing a good job either. Uh, but predators outside, people that know, okay, this is my second year, and last year I got these. Predators aren't cheap. You got to get them quick. You got to get them viable. If you know you have a problem, putting predators out definitely are a good idea in the outdoor environment. Um, there's a lot of good places uh, to source those. You can go to local insectaries to search beneficial insect insectaries on Google. You'll pull up some options. I don't know if you've had anybody on or any to recommend, but um, yeah. Th and there's uh, Arbico Organics. I'll just throw that one off the top. I know they have a lot of information on their site as far as uh, identifying predators, which ones will work good for you. And uh, yeah, so that would be that would be it. So once a week spray, is it just neem you're using or are you using any, so, any other type of products? Um, I do like to use, for me, I use neem or for whatever I'm spraying. Typically, I'll use a type of wetting agent. Uh, mine's Optic Fuller has a product called Trans Transport, um, which I use. And, and that once a week spray I'm talking about, you know, if, I, if I'm battling something, we got to break its cycle. So if we got spider mites and eggs are hatching every three days and there's variations there, how hot is it out? Um, how cold is it out is really going to affect the cycle of some of these things. But you do have to spray. If we're trying to, we've identified pests that we want to take care of, then spraying every three days for, um, I'm going to go for probably at least 10 days to two weeks should break their cycle. That being said, you can choose both methods though. If you have a garden that you're like, you don't necessarily want to spray and you have access to see what the beneficials can do for you, I recommend going that route too. I usually will do a combination of both. When I had hemp russet mites, I'm doing a spray. I'm going to beat down the population. I'm going to assume, which is the number one downfall for people spraying for pests, is it's really hard to reach everywhere in your garden. You have to make contact. 
uh, and that can be problematic. So first I'll do the spray cycle and then after that I'll maybe do two releases of beneficials just to hang out. Man, maybe I missed some eggs and things are going to hatch and that does always work for me just to take care of most pests and pests for me outside have been aphids. Those are pretty easy. They're, they're sizable. I haven't gotten thrips outside. Uh, I've seen some spider mites, hemp russet mites in Colorado. They are just, I don't know, they're popular for a little bit. Um, but we can go into the other things too, where I talked about here uh, in British Columbia, bud rot, molds, mildew. Oh my God, nightmares, literally nightmares for me. We'll save that for the end. Uh, okay. We'll talk about some of the other challenges that are going okay. on beyond pests. Uh, yeah, because that'll be a real good conversation, bud rot in particular, because I've experienced that as well. So I can also speak about that one. Forgot to mention, um, this kind of ties into maybe you can tell me if it's something else you're asking me, but healthy plants. Grow your plants as happy and healthy as possible, and that helps a ton with pests. Um, you know, a plant that's ailing or showing signs like the, the pests know, they'll come to that. They'll, they'll have an easier chance of taking it out. So Yeah, I had Chad Westport on my podcast a couple weeks awesome. ago. And he talked about bricks and kind of how you can measure the sugar content in the plant. And if your bricks level is 12% or above, then um, pests don't attack the plant, which I thought was pretty interesting. So it's another way to kind of um, kind of see the health of your plant is bricks. If, for those that don't know, might want to research a little bit more on that one. Cool. Let's switch it up. Let's talk about your media. What are you using for uh, what's in your mix? Hmm, that can vary. Definitely. We're talking, okay, we're outdoors. It's a lot of times can be what's available to you and you look where you live. Are you, if you live in Colorado and there's like 25 hydro store options around you, um, that can be a variable for sure. A base for me would probably be, uh, the HP pro mix bale of peat, right? That's cause it's just, you can get a lot out of that bale. Um, it's compact and it's usually available even at nurseries. If you don't have local grow stores and stuff, um, and then into peat, I don't make a super soil, but I do like to put things in a little bit. Worm cast, just some basics. Uh, let's put some organics in our soil. Worm castings are good to mix in. Um, you could do a 20% mix of worm castings. You could do a 10% mix. It's your call. There's a lot of recipes out there, um, which is going to give you some nutrition. It's going to give a diversity in your bacteria and your living soil. Um, other things I know you're a fan of when we had you on insect frass. It's just a cool product. I'm learning more about it. Mixing that in your soil um, also works really well. I have been cutting on and off, playing with cutting some cocoa into the peat. It seems to help with its like water inability. Peat gets hydrophobic if you don't catch it quick enough for your water on the top or it sucks in a little from the side of your containers. Um, and then you got to, the, the water kind of beads off for a minute until it absorbs in. Uh, different ratios of cocoa I've messed with. I've done like 25% cocoa to peat ratio, and it does help with that water and inability, which I've liked. So, and that's it. I don't usually mix in a lot more organics. I usually don't go to, I'm not a living soil grower, although I do like to put some things in my soil and leave room in my containers to do top dresses. Um, uh, and then after that, um, yeah, that would be the base of my mix. I'm trying to think of anything I'm forgetting that I like to put in there. Because like, again, sometimes it it does vary. Uh, oh, some compost. If there is some nice compost, I don't mind mixing in another 10% compost uh, as well. And all this just helps the overall mix. I know some people do some additional aeration. Do you do anything like um, I don't know, perlite there's, or... There's PLC. enough in uh, that specific peat, perlite, uh, for sure. And most, if you don't, if you're getting a straight peat, then yeah, I would be adding in perlite for sure. I would say 20%. Again, there's a lot of good recipes out there. Search around, uh, shout out to build a soil. They got some good recipes. They actually have, if you want to get that bale of peat, you can just get a nutrient amend kit. It's like in the instructions, it makes it real easy. So you don't have to go out and source all these different nutrients. If you're trying to do somewhat of a living soil. And when I say living soil, everybody typically, I shouldn't say everyone typically knows it's a nose, but a, a, an enriched soil that's going to be, you're relying on your soil more to feed your plants than you putting liquid or other nutrient inputs in. Great point. Now, how about container size? What do you typically start in? What do you typically end up in? So I mean, that's like, like, what kind of car do you like? Because there's so many variables with container size. Um, we just talked about this again when you're on our show. Shout out to coming on the Dude Grow Show. But what? how are you going to feed your plant? Um, I've noticed and I'm learning my peppers that I have now, which is, I think almost too small, are in one-gallon containers, Right. 
you got to feed those a lot. One gallon isn't, as we call it, a big enough battery. Like, it's just not, it can't hold enough organic matter, nutrition, whatever. That gets fed liquid nutrients uh, quite often. The bigger your container, the bigger your battery. Um, but if you can have an enriched mix, let's say. But I'm going to tell people, man, it's still relevant. I was going to tell people to do at least a 10-gallon outside. But you can see somebody that just has maybe a small apartment with a balcony. And they do three auto flowers in a... Uh, and three gals. You know what I mean? So, but I guess we're here. I'm talking about my style. I like to go at least, I'm going to say 20 to 25 gallon if I can outside. Um, you don't want to be chasing after water on hot days, depending on an irrigation setup. Uh, so the smaller the container on hotter days, the more you have to water. Uh, you do have to keep on them more with feeding. Uh, so, Bigger is going to be better. Smaller usually has a little bit more work on your end, a little bit more maintenance. Uh, and yeah, in container type, I like, I don't like the black nursery containers, man. They just, it's like, I wish they made them white, which is probably more expensive. On hot days, they sit there, you can touch the side of a black nursery container. And I just feel like my roots and my rhizosphere and my plants just going to be upset about that and require more maintenance, more water. So um, fabric pots are great. There's all kinds of brands out there. Uh, there's different, I use a product called Radical Bags. It's kind of like a mesh PVC fabric type thing. Um, but yeah, container size as well is, is important, or container type. I've seen p people kill it in the five gallon Home Depot buckets though, you know? Or you see people plant in a 30 gallon Rubbermaid trash can. I love it, just the monstrous tree. Are you just planting that seed directly into that 20 gallon? Or are you starting in a small? And then no, a up pot for sure. Okay, um, what, what's you your can... transplanting? method or techniques like when do you transplant uh so you can go outside pretty early or not it depends um where i want to end up but i'll just say i go into first typical for a lot of people a one gallon nursery pot size container um i will start a plant in there you can keep a plant in there for as long as you want and watch it get angry or hold it back or keep topping it but when i go i go from that one gal which is going to be not fully root bound, but like ready to go, whatever I put it in. And I'm going to put that one gal probably into my finishing container. I know some people, so if I go from a one gal, boom, I'm going to go outside into my 25 gal. You don't want to overwater that. It could be easy to do, but I skip the one. Maybe people would go to a five and then to the bigger size container because I just don't want to up pot and do, it's not that labor intensive for me because I'm not doing that many plants. But I like to go from the one gal to my finishing size, whether that might be a five. Mine is going to be at least a 20 to 25 gal. And I know that's okay. not as, as uh, best nursery practices. I think it's called, or, uh, Scotty, what does he call it? Something best management nursery practices. They're, they're typically, they're going like one, three, five, or one, three. Like they're keeping it all. To, and that can keep your plant chugging along a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, it's just my transplant schedule. I, I think it comes down to personal preference. I mean, some people are going to have space constraints. They're going to start indoors, and they're going to stay in that small container. They're going to try to stay as, as small a container as possible, and then, you know, um, transplant. Some folks don't want to, like you mentioned, overwatering would be a, a thing that could happen if you have this small plant in a large container. So uh, it comes down to personal preference, uh, in my opinion, on transplanting what container size to use, so on and so forth. And I don't like to deter anybody on, I mean, this is talking about my growth style. Like I said before, oh, he's saying at least a 20 or 25. Man, you can do a one gal if you want. You could try all kinds of stuff. Um, that's one thing about, as far as these medicinal plants, they love to grow outside when you have, you know, you're not, we're not worrying about having the, the expensive, nice grow light. You got the best grow light on earth, the sun kicking butt for you. Um, it's it's hard to kill these things. They love to grow, and there's a lot of ways to do it. So do it my way is not always. It, there's a lot of different styles. All I want to throw in there. Well said. Now, how about nutrients? What do you typically use for base nutrients and additives? All right. So base nutrients and additives. Uh, so my base nutrients. So my mix initially, it's not that enriched, right? Um, it's the the base peat, some cocoa. We're gonna get a little nutrition from the worm castings. Not much little nutrition from the insect frass, um, and that could last me maybe a few waterings or whatever. But I have to get watering this thing with some nutrients right away. <clears throat> I usually use a, a set of bottles lacent, re recently, um, actually for like the past three or four years, I've been using uh, Ramos nutrients, Nutrient Line. Um, and just, it's a basic, I can follow the feed chart. It's, 
eight or five mils of all the product. That's light though. Like I'm not going to a high PPM, the highest parts per million. So PPM and EC is how you guys measure your, what, how much nutrient is in your, your solution. If you don't have that pen, you're looking at a feed chart. You're like, well, I put in X, you know, you're probably going to be within the range um, that they want you to be in. But that's, that's not my only nutrition. And some people will be like, that's pretty low, 700 parts per million. Well, then I'm also going to take a break with some of my, as we say, the fish brings the dank. Maybe I'm going to add in, so there's a bunch of different fish fertilizers out there, a little bit of fish because I like to diversify what inputs I'm putting in. And I believe, you know, I like some of the thicker, funkier products at times. Uh, or top dressing. I know you like to top dress. So, um, I used to before I start, stopped using bat guano. I do need to do more research into... I think I saw an, uh, like a scary documentary on Netflix where I'm like, this is how they get the seabird? Like, I don't know, man. And how the people in their camps, it just didn't seem cool to me. I'll look into it a little more. But when I had bat guano, it's a good um, bone. Actually, I think I have fish bone meal now, which is a byproduct of the fishing industry, which is a high phosphorus. I'll take these products and I'll do a top dress at different points in the grow. Maybe it's uh, blooms really coming on. Um, just to feed the plant in all different ways. I feel like I'm giving it's the, the word synganic, uh, where you're feeding synthetically or salt-based nutrients and organically or just, you know, nutrients. Uh, and I do stay away from meals. I get a little freaked out of uh, big egg, bone meal, blood meal. It's just, I don't know. I, I, I need to learn more about what possibly might be in those byproducts. I don't know if any of the antibiotics or funkiness from that industry comes over, but I don't, I have other things I can use in my garden where I don't need to use those. So I'm um, trying to think what else. I do have some favorite, like, I don't know if you do, like, do you water in with any bottles at all? Yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. Do you have any favorite bloom additives or something like that's a typical additive or that you would use? I used to use, back in the day, I used to use a PK Booster. I used to use Beastie Blooms by Fox Farm when I was using the Fox Farm lineup, and that, that helped. And it was always, the, when I worked hydroponic retail, it would be one of the most hottest, like, people would be like, all right, I'm a month into flower, what kind of boost does he got? Like, what's, what, what kind of boost? Oh, this is a zero sixty. you know, like, they just get pumped, but it's not all about that. I do really like, it's kind of a unique one, um, Massive from Green Planet is a, like, a tricantinol type, and there's more in it than that, and I don't even know if they can market it as that, um, but it's one I really dig on. I'm trying to think what other bloom boost does. Typically, if you have your base nutrition really rocked, though, it's not about doing a big booster. You can mess up things in your isosphere. You can kind of, I think, affect what's going on with the microbes if you go too high in with phosphorus. Uh, so watch that. But, yeah, that would be one of my, my main, main additives. And, of course, I haven't said it in any of this. I, use re I know you like recharge. I use recharge across throughout the grow. That's one of the things that... In a roundabout way, for me, ties into IPM. Recharge, guys, is just a, a microbial inoculant. If you aren't using microbes, you want to be adding microbes. We only have so much time with this plant, right, to get it right uh, and kick out a good, a good crop. Are there any other microbial inoculants you use beyond recharge? And, and do you use any sugars? Like some people use molasses, honey, brown sugar. Do you do any of that? Or? Um, recharge has enough molasses in it to where I don't need to add another sugar. Sugar, guys, is going to feed the microbes. I like to diversify my sugars because I think if I'm a microbe, maybe I want to eat something different than molasses today. That's where I get into, God, I don't know the name. Fox Farm has, uh, they have a line, something like a bembe or bembe line. Maybe it's actually called bembe. It was like a, a sugar uh, from, I believe, from beets. And I was like, interesting. Okay, I can picture maybe some, maybe some of the microbes, and this is kind of bro science or just me making myself a microbe will be more turned on by eating some of this beet sugar today and do some type of different app attribute in my, my terpene profile, you know? Um, so other than that, what other sugars have I used? Just those two mainly as far as a, a sugar to feed the microbes. Yeah. And other micro products. Sorry, you asked. Um, I did, I haven't since just availability up here. Microbes in Canada are really goofy. It's just goofy regulation thing. Hard to get your hands on some. Um, Oh, oh, Mammoth P. Damn, I don't know why I'm, I'm stumbling on that. Mammoth P I've used on and off uh, as well. And I have it in a while, but I would still recommend at Transplant. There are some cool, I don't know if you know any, but um, mycorrhizae products that are specifically one strain. I think the Intradices, that it's nice at Transplant to get that uh, on, I think, Mycos, 
when you can get that on the root zone, when you're actually transplanting, you can put some mycorrhizae in the hole, make sure you got that connection. Uh, that's one good time to use another type of, that's actually a fungi, mycorrhizae. I pretty much use the same products. I think the, the mammoth pea and recharge combination is incredible. I mean, they, they both just work so well together. You know, I remember using recharge and mammoth pea several grows ago and <laughs> taking it out of the one gallon container. Uh, the roots were just so amazingly pearly white, like beautiful. And just, I, I never got that before, you know, using recharge, you know, so uh, in mammoth pea together. So I highly recommend that combination for anybody who is interested in, you know, using, trying out some new micro products. Learn about microbes too. If you guys, you don't have to learn a ton, but um, that was in my, I don't know if I had my top three. I don't know if it was uh, LED lighting, CO2 and microbes off the top of my head, but microbes, man, game changer for the grow. You're going to do a lot better and don't think it's a misconception. Um, I used to think this as well, like, oh, when I'm using synthetic nutrients or salt-based nutrients or this, it just, it's not going to work well with the microbes. They can work together for sure in your grow media. Uh, so yeah, look into that. If you're not, it'll, it'll help your grow. Great point. Now you mentioned one other thing on feeding. I know you mentioned Ramo nutrients and you measure, mentioned these other things. You're doing some top feeding fish, so on and so forth. Are you following the feeding schedule for Ramo nutrients at all? Or are you doing a reduced dose or are you not looking at that feeding schedule? I try to just have a plan. I mean, I, I feel the feeding schedule is the basis. They're aligned specifically. Um, it's super easy because it's always the same amount p- across the board. Doesn't matter what bottle you're using until, uh, you know, if you, you can start off at five mils and that gives you this PPM and then you can go up to eight mils or you can go up to 10 mils. So it depends on what you're doing. So I don't follow a feeding schedule particularly um, as far as if a new grower. Sometimes it's nice to say, okay, here's a nutrient line. Let me hand you their feeding schedule. You follow this and you should be good. And that's right. You, you should be good. Know your quality, your quality, uh, your water starting points. If you can, if you're on a well or whatever you're on, it is nice to know to get either a water test. Or know your starting PP, or, uh, pH. My starting pH is 7. I'm on a well here in British Columbia. My PPMs off the tap are, I think, one. It's like the water's so good here. Um, there's nothing in it. But to know that starting point is good uh, for sure. And then after that, you should succeed. The only thing that'll mess up a feeding chart is if you have hiccups in the grow and you, you, you need to slow down on something or you need to not feed. Um, and then outside, speaking of all this, I don't know if this ties into something you got coming up. If your plants aren't protected from weather and rain, rain alone is going to adjust. Like if it keeps raining and you're like, damn, I got to water in my liquid nutrients. I got to get nutrition in there. That can be a conundrum because your plant's wet already. And that's why it's good to cover yourself with, well, it's been raining, but I did have some top dress. So that's kind of like a tip there. If you know you got some weather coming, because it could rain for like a week straight. Happened to be in Colorado. Plants are always wet. I can't add any nutrition. Um, nor are they probably going crazy at that point. It's cloudy out. It's been raining on them. But uh, if you can't add nutrition and you know weather's coming, you can always top dress some nutrition as well. And that doesn't even have to be organic amendments. They have vegetable granular fertilizer out there where it's just like Osmocote type stuff where you sprinkle a little on there and you know if you you water through um, with plain water, you're going to get nutrition. If that answered your question with the feeding chart. Yeah, Hope I'm not dude. rambling. I got my cold brew kicking in here. I need a little caffeine going, so just if you need to cut me off at all, I don't know. No, that's all good. You're actually ahead of the game a little bit. My next question was going to be about water, and you touched on well water. Uh, you know, your water source well, is clean going in, which is good. My, my next question was going to be talking about pH. Now, uh, is your pH good? Like, what does it come in at to begin? And are you doing any sort of adjustments? Are you monitoring it all? or? Okay, I got that. Just quick with the well water. If you guys got hard well, like if you got high PPM in your well water, let's say you get a little pen and it's like, holy shit, it's like at 400, 500, 600. It's good to know what's in there. I think I haven't had to deal with it. I'm no expert. A lot of times I think it can be calcium. There are different liquid nutrients that um, you can adjust your nutrients to that PPM. So you're not giving too much of one thing or the other. But if you do have that, high of PPM. I would like to know what's in there. I would consider a water test if that's going to be your main source. Or after that, if you don't, you, you got to look at a water filtration system such as RO, um, which gives you a zero starting point. That's why uh, when p- commercial facilities, when they got to replicate their feeding plan across multiple facilities or anything, everybody has the same RO system. 
So when the lead grower over here is looking over here, he knows that everybody's starting at the same point, at least with nutrients. So if you do have, or even city water, not just well water, check that, man. I've heard of some people say they're, I don't know, what's your, do you know what your PPM is where you're at? Is it high? My tap is like 485. Yeah. Do you know what, now what, what's in there or what does that? Uh, I mean, I have the water report that I get from the, from the city, but I don't, I, I don't, know I don't, I can't always trust that either. So many, it seems like variables with what's in the pipes between here and there and the other thing. Um, but anyway, check that guys, know your, your water report. Then you asked about pH. My starting pH is seven. Um, I don't know. Most nutrients, I don't know about most rainbow nutrients buffer down. Typically, I think they anticipate a seven ish starting point because I always brings me down within range, which is going to be upper fives, 5.9 to 6 point, I'll, I'll water in 5.9 to 6.4 or 5, um, or even high, <clears throat> excuse me, even higher. If you have a lot, a lot of my, microbes active, they're going to help buffer out and take care of this if you're a little out of range. Okay. And then you touched on PPM and EC earlier a little bit. You threw out a couple values. I know you threw out 700 PPM. Can you tell me like what values you aim for? Like some people will start with a low PPM during seedling stage, then they'll kind of yep. work their way up. Can you tell me kind of your strategy for PPM or, or EC? Yeah, I think uh, it's been overdone a lot with uh, when people like to push medicinal plants super hard to get the most they can out of it. And then Maybe you should come on back and try to go lower. Mine would be, okay, early veg, I'm around, you know, three, 400, primetime veg, meaning, man, these things are going, everything's happy. I could go, you can go up to, I'm still staying probably around though, five to 600. And I'm not saying if you went higher, it might, it, this can be strain dependent as well, depending on your plants. Um, but 750 to 800 is what I max out, out at. And I don't see, I see not diminish, I guess diminishing returns might be the right phrase. When I go higher, I'm not seeing more come out of the plant. Um, you can mess with it, of course, if, if you're growing the same type of plant season after season. But if you change up the strain or the plant type, then you just, how, you, how do you track that? But less seems to be more typically, I'll say, not all of them. Nutrient companies want to put down, like, what? They're not going to put down the least amount you could use. I mean, they, I'm not saying they're there to rip you off, um, but they're going to go a little bit on the higher end. Sometimes the uh, nutrient charts off are three different levels. I've seen, like, it's funny. Some will be like, are you at the master level? Are you at the pro level? Are you at the beginner level? Which I don't know why they word it like that. Um, but less is more. See what your plant, don't overdo it. Underdoing it's a little better. Um, and if you want to try and bump up at different times, uh, go for it. But again, using microbes, I keep going there. Uh, th th that helps with nutrition across the board. And I have not needed high PPM at all since doing that. I'm always lower than the feed chart. And if you don't want to mess with all that and you're intimidated by that, you, you don't have to. You put a plant out in a container with some enriched soil, some compost, water in some microbes. And, you know, there's also just bagged soil out there that uh, ocean forest is the most commonly available across the nation, or I've heard different growers, granted, uh, it's not gonna work for all strains, but man, all I did is water in with some ocean forest, which is an enriched soil, and I got a harvest. Uh, you probably can do better, you're probably gonna run out of nutrition getting towards middle, towards the end, but this it can be real easy or easier than worrying about PPM, pH, uh, but I grow synganic, so both values, so I'm taking care of all of it. Gotcha. Let's flip it up and talk about plant training. So what plant training techniques do you typically oh, man, do you when you're growing outdoors? On it, outside, when these things want to grow like bees. I mean, you can do a lot of different training tactics. I mean, if it's, uh, first would be, you're going to want to top a bit. Because uh, these plants, you're going to, when you're going to go to bloom, in Colorado, it was around mid-August, I'd start to see flowers come in. I'd assume I was two weeks in. Um, I wouldn't. I would want my plants to be, and this is relevant to, uh, you know, how big a plants you can grow, but I would top them back like three or four times. Topping your plant, you're taking off X amount of the top of your plant down to a node, um, and you can, you know, Google that out and see exactly. It's pretty easy to do. The only time you, you don't want to do this, if you know, like, oh man, I'm going to be going to bloom probably in about 10 days. For me, I had set that date at August 15th. So the last time I do some topping, would be maybe August 1st. So I have a little bit of recovery time for new shoots to come out and everything to be good. But keep in mind, you're gonna gain at least, I'm gonna say across the board, two feet, if not three feet 
maybe four feet when you get into bloom, and that's when training can come in too, where you're doing your bending over. You can literally make sure your plant's properly watered and healthy, bending over your stems. Some people will just bend to not get a break. Sometimes I even bend to get a little bit of a break in the stem because I know how quick these are going to recover. You can do a tie-down method where you're taking part of a plant and you're bending it way over here maybe because it needs to stay below a fence. Uh, and also thinning, outside thinning your plants out to get rid of those microclimates. When you're out there scouting for pests, you're not going crazy through, like you got to thin it out a little for air movement and not creating microclimates uh, for pests. And speaking about the fence, uh, the, having the plant not grow over the fence, I think you got, I got some, some good comments on whatever, outdoor security, your neighbors, that kind of thing as well. I think you have a question on here. I know some people who swear by the 45 degree angle method. They just do this one, outdoors in particular, they just do a one bend of that bean shoot at 45 degrees and that's going to allow the lowers to come up, which I thought was pretty interesting. It really helps create more shoots coming up so it's not just like a Christmas tree style that you typically see. Yeah. Um, so that's one basic, easy thing that you can do for, for training, um, you know, when growing outdoors. You can do it indoors too, sure, but um, we're, you know, we're focusing on outdoors on, on this video. Now, what about uh, more more so pruning, defoliation, lollipopping? Do you do any of that stuff growing outdoors? Yeah, for sure. Defoliation, I mean, that was tying into kind of where I'm talking about thinning out your canopy, thinning out your mid. Lollipopping, like you said, definitely, that's bringing up your lower branches, so again, that can be an area where if you have that all thick down there where you're, you might get a problem at the soil. I like to see my soil level. Um, I, I was about to say I like to put sticky traps out at soil level, but that's more for indoors for me. Out, sticky traps outside, I feel like I'm catching some good guys too, and it, it hurts my feelings. But um, yeah, pruning your plant up, lollipopping it up, uh, definitely important. You'll get even more of those shoots. It was hard for me as a new grower to cut off a lot of the lower ones because it's like, oh, there's going to be some good flower on here or here. Uh, but really uh, taking those off, and I don't like to fully lollipop it up two or three feet, but taking a lot of those off uh, to enable to send that energy and to send all that to the upper parts of the plant uh, works great. Let's get into challenges growing outdoors. So indoors, outdoors, totally different battlefield. I mean, we already talked about pests. That's one challenge you got to face. Well, and you said pests. So I just I was just scrolling my notes. I did want to mention one other thing before I forget about IPM. Uh, we don't have this option as much on the indoors. Um, and outside, if it doesn't, I mean, depending, my plants are usually always covered outside, which we can get into. But spraying your plant, taking the hose and just giving your plants a really good wash. I mean, it's a simple, plus you're going to get naturally outside. You'll get some type of dust or pollen or you can be, actually for me here now in British Columbia, smoke particles from fires going on somewhere. Washing your plants is a good idea, and the same, it'll wash off potential negative egg sacs or pests that are bothering stuff, and it's super easy to do. Even if it was once every other day and you're just, just clean off your outside garden, it's a good, a good tip. Sorry. No, all good. So you just blast them with plain water. Now, when you say wash your plants, are you also talking about bud washing at the end after harvesting? I haven't done bud washing, and the, when you wash your plants, it'll show your weak points and where you might not have them staked up properly as well, because sometimes they'll just bend way over whatever, but... Um, get that those plants staked up with bamboo. Um, bud washing, I mean, it's it's not the end of the world if your buds get wet, um, if they get rained on, but I don't intentionally try to wash buds at, at any point with, uh, yeah, pressurized, pressurized water. Okay. Now, some of the other challenges that you faced uh, growing outdoors, um, like I was mentioning, is that there's so many different things beyond pests. One of the things that you had mentioned earlier was bud rod. You want to talk about bud rod a little bit? Sure, because that was one that just came, I mean, there's a few different types, like bud rot can be just some rot in the bud that you get from a type of like bacteria or mold, I believe. Um, sometimes just buds that are really big and dense. I grew big bud crossed with white widow outside and the buds were so big and beautiful looking and I didn't know I had the rot. Um, and this was in Colorado until I started trimming. And I was like, oh, that's when it's really disappointing because I wasn't even anticipating it. Um, and for me, it came from corn earworms. Corn earworms, if I understand right, I'm trying to recall, is I believe a moth that laid like an egg or something, and then this thing comes, it's a caterpillar, and a caterpillar-looking thing just goes around throughout your bud, and when it does, it shits. And then we have the feces from the caterpillar in there, which creates the rot. 
Um, well, it's so that was kind of interesting to me. It wasn't actually this caterpillar would be like a half inch long. Um, it going around causing it was actually it's taking a dump my flowers that caused the problem. I did not have my <laughs> flowers protected. There's different ways you could try and handle it. Um, BTI Bacillus thuringiensis subspecies Israeliensis is a product. Interesting enough, though, these things have become resistant to it on and off because everybody uses it. And the corn earworm usually affects corn crops, um, but it is found in the medicinal plants, some of the flower structure. I don't know if it thinks maybe the moths like that looks like a corn stalk or not, but it messes with it. And the only way for this one that I have found, maybe when I try to set up a grow next season a little bit smaller, is putting out the fine bug netting that you can buy for agricultural purposes. And therefore, these moths and things cannot fly into your plants uh, because it's just such a bummer. I mean, I and, and then I did get a little PM um, and there's not a lot you can do. I mean, you can grow plants. Actually, I could take that back. There are plants and there are uh, breeders for different areas um, that you might be able to get a strain that is less susceptible to that type of issue. I always cite an instance on the indoor, um, indoor grow tent back in the day. I had four plants in it, three of them completely got PM, like it was horrible. And one of them, same tent, leave share in space, I never got it. I was like, this is interesting. These are all the same type of plant, but different strains. And this one just won't get it. So there's an example of uh, PM, really powdery mildew when I say PM, these other plants. So it's hard to control that a lot. There's different sprays and things you can do for PM. You gotta be on it, but man, depending on the size of your garden, can really up your labor a lot trying to deal with these things um, outside. So, kind of going back to bud rot, I had bud rot before indoors, and I'll briefly talk about this. Yeah. I uh, had plants where I decided to do no training because I usually do training and topping and low stress training and all that stuff. And I was like, you know what, my audience wants to see something different. Let me do no training for the beginners who, who don't want to train. So, I had all these plants, and they had nice, real big colas coming up. Um, and unfortunately my fan died overnight. The oscillating fan that I had died overnight and I only had one fan in there. So that's a mistake. That's one thing going back, yeah. always have two fans in your environment in case one dies. Uh, that's something I'm, I'm doing moving forward. Um, but really it, you know, I, I noticed it that my fan had to have just been uh, dead for like 24 hours. So there's no air movement whatsoever. Right. And the humidity skyrocketed. Uh, overnight, you know, I don't, I don't remember if I like just watered the plants that the previous night or not. But um, what I'm trying to say is that the bud rot happened like pretty much overnight. Now, once you get bud rot, it starts to form. It starts to form like on the stem and then kind of works its way out. I'm talking about uh, Botrytis cinerea in particular. Um, it'll, uh, it'll continue to grow. So although I fixed that fan issue, I still have, like two more weeks left in the grow. The fans were going, I had air movement, but that botrytis, that's still there. It doesn't just magically stop yeah. growing. It doesn't magically just disappear. So, like, I got all the way to harvest, and then I noticed actually that I had botrytis. I was like, what the, what the hell? This is terrible. It was complete. Now, luckily, it was only that top main cola, right, the fattest ones. The lower mm -hmm. buds were fine. So like That's in that typical, case, too. Yeah. So, in that case, I just Take threw away those top one. colas as sad as it was. They were beautiful, and it sucks to take that cola and just throw it in the trash but you gotta do what you gotta do right don't want to be smoking that crap but yeah the lower buds were fine in there but it was uh it's not fun it's not fun that air movement is important and one other thing to mention is you can identify if bud rot's happening if the leaves coming from the cola if it starts to yellow from the bottom of the You'll leaves see bump, that's an indicator that you could potentially have bud rot you so. can um you notice you'll see some of the little leaves coming out of developed flowers. This is the last grow I forgot to mention on the and we've been talking outdoor, I've been thinking, but indoor, my last harvest, I probably lost about not bad, maybe ten percent of the flowers, but you would see I could you just be looking around in the canopy and this unhappy fan leaf or not fan leaf, but leaf sticking out of the flower. And so a test is to just grab that. And then if it pulls right out super easy, and then you can see a potentially a little bit of dust or whatever, you know, like that area is contaminated. And what I did for that is I would just immediately take a, uh, just a plastic garbage bag or whatever over it and then snip below it. Cause I'm worried about, you don't want and turn off all your fans 
and hope none of that little dust spreads around anywhere, but assume you're already going to be dealing with it. And you're going to, when you get to final processing of your plants, you're going to run into more of it and just be pleasantly surprised if not. Yeah, it's not fun at all. I, uh, now I also, another tip is I make sure I set up alerts. So I use a sensor push alert. I know some people use like the pulse, but I have uh, alerts come to my smartphone. If my humidity is too high, well, I get an alert on my smartphone. I know I need to go take action. So I can see now if the fan does die out, well, I should be getting an alert. Yeah. But, yeah, it's not, not fun at all getting bud rot. Right, what I've other challenges? Other, have? Yeah, I've got a few other good ones here, some fun yeah. ones here. Timer malfunction. Okay, so in uh, Colorado, I had four, four, outdoor, four or five outdoor grows. Um, and the first thing I realized I'm going to need to – eventually because uh the first season i put no protection over my plants i lived in an area where every once in a while it was almost guaranteed we're gonna get some hail that comes through um so and i could see i was like addicted to i'd sit at the computer when i'd see it look at uh the weather underground or whatever and i'd have the enhanced radar i'd be like man it's coming and i'd be like i gotta stay home this afternoon no mountain biking i'd have umbrellas ready after that season i set up uh what i call my tiki grow where I used, you can get the corrugated uh, greenhouse panels from Home Depot. They're not that expensive. And then I'm not a handy carpenter, but I can rig stuff up. And a grow tip here is you can get two foot long pieces of rebar that are already pre-cut at Home Depot and easily pound that one foot into the ground. And then they sell all kinds of different sizes of bamboo, but there's bamboo poles that were eight foot or maybe 10 foot tall that the bottom diameter of them were big enough just to slide over that rebar. And I was like, boom. Now that and some green zip ties, I'm starting to grow. Plus, I want my outdoor grow to look kind of cool. And I thought having a bamboo like grow shack over it with some corrugated plastic panels works great. And it did. It stayed up for like seven years. So if you can protect your plants from even if it's just rain and weather and figure out how to rig something up or even if it's a structure that temporarily goes over them, you're a huge advantage there. But I'd run into weather... Um, as far as the challenge here, that, man, the sun's going away or it was going to get too cold. And I had spare grow lights sitting around. So I had put out two 600 watts and a 1,000 watt HPS out over my outdoor grow. And then had a timer malfunction coming home at night. It's dark out. And in between my house and the neighbor's house, it looks like a UFO's landing. <laughs> like, <laughs> luckily, I, I, at that point, I lived on a court. I knew all the neighbors. At that, I wasn't doing, uh, at that point in time, my garden was allowed I didn't have anything to worry about or to get in trouble for, uh, but that was just rather interesting to be like, whoa. Uh, l talking about lighting, if you if you grow outside, light pollution. Uh, does your neighbor have a light that might shine to where your garden to affect its photo period? I had a street light in front of my house, so I was like, oh, what am I getting to do about this? Because you don't want to have light pollution coming in. They can handle some, don't get me wrong. Think about how bright it is when a full moon's out. But for this particular situation, um, it's like, okay, we can't do anything to the light that we can't, we can't vandalize the light or do anything to the light. Uh, so I set up a ladder and actually I took a piece of foil and spray painted it primer gray. It looked kind of gray like the light and just wrapped the back side of it that pointed towards my house and just used some, uh, some type of zip ties. I believe that lasted like five years as well. And my neighbor's actually like, thank you. That light used to shine into our window. So be careful of light pollution out there. Anticipate where you're going to put your garden. Are you going to get any light pollution from your neighbor's security light or outside lights? Um, and then it ties into smell, man. You can have some smell from medicinal plants and different, you know, different strains, different strengths of smells. Uh, my neighbors were cool, but also sensitive to it at times. Like that's getting kind of strong, dude. Uh, but you know, keep that in mind and you can do a little research into that, into what, which plants might give you more smell than others at prime times and flowering. Um, so that would be, I don't know. And so, I don't know. Did you, did you want a little security talk at all or? Uh, no, that's good. What I was going to mention, you remind me of, uh, when you talk about the smell one time, it would mean three of my buddies were trimming and, uh, FedEx guy came, rang the doorbell. And so I opened up the door and he had to have smelled something really strong because uh, you know, he just smiled. I, yeah. Well, well, no. He he saw my shirt. I had a grow shirt on. He's like, "Oh, that's what that smell was." <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and so, so yeah. yeah. I mean, kind of that wraps into security, right? If you don't want people to, um, you know, know what you're doing, you want to hide the smell with, you know, carbon filters or air filtration systems. 
Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about security a little bit, sure. For you, it was the FedEx guy you said. For me, it was the my mail lady. She's at the mailbox, and she's like, <laughs> huh. And, uh, and then the next time she's at the mailbox, I'm like, so you're, uh, are you guarding at all? And she's like, talks a little. I'm like, here's some free recharge. You know, just make sure she's happy. So, but it was all good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, keeping your garden um, out of sight if need be. Uh, Keeping it to where there's not a lot you can do about smell if the wind's going the right direction and you have neighbors close by. Sometimes that's going to happen. You can blame blame skunks if need be. Um, but yeah, keeping it you know out of sight and uh, secure as possible. Um, things are changing all the time with how secure you need to keep a grow, and and it really it's nice to share your grow if you can. Uh, but uh, the less people that know, the better. It's easy to put things you know out it's to notify you know this day and age with technology and the affordability of different cameras or things that can let you know hey somebody's in your garden or maybe even you're catching that can tie into animals or pests you know if you want to know that something's there that shouldn't be deer will really love to eat your plants um, you can get other types of pests that might come in and really like to eat your plants but having a notification if somebody's been there somebody's there uh, is good and just be around man be around your plants like it be around your grow as much as you can it's good for you it's healthy for you. It's free therapy, if you will. I don't know about free. We do we do invest in our grows, but yeah, be around to check things out. That's definitely some really really good advice. So. All right, so wrapping things up, how can listeners find you, and what do you have upcoming in the future? Dude grows, as uh, Scotty, my co-host, says, yell "Dude grows" at your phone. Dude grow show, man. I think we've been doing this almost eight years now. Um, we do shows every day of the week. If you want to listen to some grow talk, make sure you check out the grow talk episodes. We have a show called Wake and Bake which is news, culture, and entertainment, and whatever else might come out of our mouths. Hang out on that show and just get down. Uh, what's coming up? More Dude Grow Show. We come up with ideas to change things up or do something a little different. Content collaboration with people such as yourself. Thank you. Always like to do that. Uh, but keeping the shows coming out uh, every day of the week is really uh, not the challenge, but the joy. and keeps us pretty busy. Find us at dudegrows.com as our webpage. We're over on YouTube or podcast, any podcast player we should be on, uh, Stitcher, Apple, Spotify. Just yell Dude Grows at your phone and you'll see what we got going on. Awesome. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. I release these podcast episodes every single weekend. Typically, it's on Saturdays. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, um, actually, Apple Podcasts in particular, leave a rating or review. Uh, that definitely helps the ranking. I'm just about to pass 100 ratings and reviews, so thank you everyone who has left that. Share this podcast if you haven't already. If, if you know somebody who would benefit from this information, uh, please share it. Dude, thank you so much for coming on to this podcast today. This has been a, a great talk. Definitely provides some value to those that are growing outdoors. Uh, so I appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Back at you. Peace out, guys.